and welcome to our webinar today, GMAT or GRE, which one should you take? Uh, this webinar is for everyone who is planning to apply to a master or an MBA program and who is not sure which admission test to choose. Uh, my name is Nelly and I will be the moderator on behalf of my prep team. And our speaker today will be Anshu Vat, uh, the founder of 700 Plus Club. Uh, he has 10 years of experience in standardized uh, test preparation and has guided thousands of students to their best scores. Uh, before starting, I just want to let you know that you can ask questions anytime during the webinar using the Q&A box, and we'll take time to answer. Uh, all questions are welcome, so don't hesitate. Uh, so I think uh, everything is set now, and I'm giving the floor to you, Ashu. Thanks, Nelly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anshul, and I will be your speaker for today. Uh, our topic today is uh, GMAT or GRE. Talk a bit about what is GMAT, what is GRE, and then we see the differences based on certain parameters. I want to leave you guys with with a proper scheme of how you should decide uh, which test to invest in. Uh, quick thoughts about GMAT. Uh, it's a standardized test, so is GRE. It's administered by GMAT. <clears throat> and the fundamental idea of GMAT is to test uh, your, your readiness for a business program. Uh, on average, there are around 300,000 people who take the GMAT every year. Uh, while talking of GRE, it's a, it's a graduate record examination. Uh, it's specifically designed earlier. It was designed for all the graduate programs, not the business programs. but Recently, in the past 10 years, uh, a lot of business schools are steadily accepting GRE as an alternative to GMAT. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's almost double the number of test takers every year. Now, uh, remember those numbers because going ahead, that will be an important consideration that, that will come into play. Uh, as I said, both are standardized exams. They both have been in play for around 60 years now, and they're pretty good at what they do, which is predict uh, you versus the other candidates. Now, let's look at some of the comparisons between the GMAT and GRE, uh, starting with the scores. Now, anyone who has taken a GMAT or done a research will see that uh, GMAT gives you a cumulative score. Uh, usually people say, I got a 700 or I got a 750. Uh, the score ranges from 200 to 800. Uh, every year around 35 people, 35 to 40 people out of the 300,000 get a perfect score on GMAT. Uh, GRE, on the other hand, does not give you a cumulative score. So you don't get a score out of 340. Uh, a lot of people usually say, uh, I got 327, 328. They add up the score themselves. So by default, the exam doesn't add up the score. So you get a separate score for the quant. You get a separate score for the verbal. Now, GRE, the score varies from 130 to 170. So you're playing for 40 points, right? Both in verbal and in quant. Uh, on the on the other side, GMAT, uh, it uses a pretty robust algorithm. So, and how the algorithm calculates your score is not public. So when you take the test, uh, you get what we call the raw score. So both for quantitative and verbal, you can score anywhere from six to 51. And these raw scores are then translated into the, the final score as a combination. Apart from these two main areas of quant and verbal, uh, you have other areas in both the tests. Now, going back to GMAT, so in total, there are four sections, analytical writing, integrated reasoning, and the quantitative and verbal. Uh, analytical writing is scored from zero to six. Uh, integrated reasoning, you get a score from zero to eight. But these are not part of the overall GMAT score from 200 to 800. So they are scored separately, uh, which means for the GMAT score, when you say 700 or, or 750, we are basically talking about the quantitative and the verbal sections only. Uh, in terms of GRE, apart from the verbal and quant scores, which you get from 130 to 170, you have also analytical writing, uh, which is typically essays where you get a score from zero to six. So this is the idea about the scores. Now, what is the structure of the test? So continuing ahead, if you look in GMAT, you have around four sections typically lasts for around three hours. Uh, GRE, on the other hand, it has around six sections and it lasts you know, 45 minutes longer than the GMAT, so around three hours and 45 minutes. Uh, 
the, the sections in GMAT are analytical writing assessment, which is typically one essay, uh, 30 minutes. Then you will have what we call integrated reasoning section, which is uh, more about uh, you know, gathering the information from different data sources and reasoning and coming to a conclusion. A pretty new topic in GMAT relatively. Uh, you get 12 questions, uh, you have 30 minutes to answer. Then you come to quantitative and the verbal reasoning section. Quantitative section has 31 questions and you have two minutes per question, leaving you 62 minutes to complete the section. Verbal has a slightly less time, 36 questions, 65 minutes, so one minute and around 50 seconds. Talking about GRE, you have six sections. Uh, this is where it gets a bit uh, misty, the GRE. So you have one hour section where you have the essays, two essays. Uh, that's always the first section, right? So you have to write two essays, uh, 30 minutes each. Then you have quantitative reasoning sections. Uh, you have two sections for quantitative. Every section will have 20 questions. So in total, 40 questions. The same goes for verbal. You have two verbal sections, 20 questions per section. So in total, 40 questions. Uh, as you can see, verbal has slightly less time than the quant. You get 35 minutes for 20 questions in the quantitative section versus 30 minutes for 20 questions in the verbal section. Now, apart from these uh, five sections, there's also one more section which is uh, unidentified or unscored, uh, which you'd never know. It could be a, another quantitative section or it could be another verbal section. Uh, you will not know. And this, the meaning of unidentified is that you will never know which one is the one that is not scored. So practically speaking, you will be working with five sections of verbal and quant mix could be three of quant, two of verbal, or two of verbal, uh, two of quant and three of verbal, uh, but you will never know which one is the unscored one. Uh, sometimes also it happens that you you might have a, what, what they call the research section. Now, the research section is always mentioned. It's always the one at the end. Uh, you might have it, you may not have it, but if you have it, you will always know that it's the research section. So you can you know, answer it as you as you want. Uh, another important difference is GMAT, there is no calculator allowed. Uh, the only calculator that is allowed is for the integrated reasoning section, and that is an on-screen calculator. Whereas in GRE, you have uh, the calculator allowed for all the quantitative part. Uh, again, it's an on-screen calculator. We will, we will discuss it a bit more later. Uh, not many people are fond of the calculator just because it's on-screen, and uh, in most of the cases, I mean, if you use the calculator, you are actually pretty much wasting your time uh, putting in all the all the numbers and so on. But it, it just feels good that there is a calculator if you need it. But it has another purpose, which we will discuss a bit later. So this is the structure of the two tests. Uh, the test order. Now, the test order is how you can take the test. Do you have to follow a specific order or you can choose? Uh, GMAT gives you choices. Uh, you have three choices that you can choose. Uh, by default, you can start with the essay, do the integrated reasoning, then the quantitative one, and then the verbal one. It's a default section. Or it gives you a choice to start with either quantitative or the verbal one. Uh, and this sometimes helps students because uh, if you are a test taker who starts very high, so you are super pumped at the beginning, but then as the test progresses, you kind of lose the energy. Uh, you would prefer starting with either quant or verbal, right? So you don't have to start with the essays by default. Uh, that sometimes helps in the, in the test taking strategy. Uh, in case of GRE, uh, no luck. You will start with the analytical writing section. So the essays are the first thing you will do, uh, no matter what. And even after that, you, you have no clear idea of uh, what is gonna come next. So the, the sections can be jumbled in whatever order. There is no predefined order. The only thing you know is for sure, you will have two sections of quant and two sections of verbal. In which order, nobody knows. The general one is, one is followed by the other. So if you have a quant one, usually the next one will be verbal, but it's not a given. So this is about the test order. Now this is the, this is the big part, uh, adaptiveness. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard about that they are both adaptive tests, computer adaptive, and it's it's true. 
uh, GMAT is question adaptive, while as GRE is a section adaptive test. Now, what does it mean, question adaptive? Uh, in case of GMAT, it's like you start with a certain level of question, you must answer the question, and based on if you answer the question correctly, the next question will be a bit harder than the previous one. And the whole idea of the algorithm is in the limited questions, let's say 31 questions of quant, the algorithm tries to understand what is your level. So it adapts after every question. And while as GRE is section adaptive, now what that means is you get a set of 20 questions, right? Section one, let's say, based on your performance on these 20 questions, right? Overall performance. The next section can be easier, can be medium, or can be a harder section. Uh, your goal is to get never the easy section, the second one. So GRE is more section adaptive. Now, th there are certain parameters that, that can help you understand this a bit more. One of the things is having a question adaptive test uh, has a lot of implications in terms of uh, time management, uh, in terms of your, your whole strategy about the test. Uh, a lot of people who feel anxious uh, with, with tests, uh, we see a lot of students who, who genuinely suffer from the from test anxiety, uh, they tend to prefer GRE just because it gives you a bit more control on how you proceed between the section. So you can you can within the twenty questions you can choose which questions to do. You can skip the question and come back to them later, right? So just this idea of having uh, this flexibility eases a bit of the tension. Uh, now. While on GMAT, you cannot move to the next question without answering the previous question, right? Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, by default, both the tests uh, will induce some kind of anxiety. They are both high stakes tests. But when I say test anxiety, I mean real test anxiety that you, you get a brain freeze or you feel nausea and you have suffered that in the past. If, if that is who you are as a test taker, uh, generally speaking, based on the stats, uh, GRE might be a better option for you just because of the flexibility it gives. Uh, another thing about the, the adaptiveness is GR, uh, GMAT being question adaptive. I mean, the algorithm is always, always pinpointing your level after every question. Now, what does that mean for you as a test taker? Uh, for any standardized test, uh, if you think about there are two main things. One is your accuracy and the other is your speed. GMAT really wants to have a, a proper balance between your accuracy and the speed, right? Uh, which means uh, based on uh, your performance, based on, on how you have prepared, you know which questions to skip. Uh, by skip, I mean not waste time and pick a random answer. And what are the questions that you should really put your efforts in? Um, and because it's question adaptive, it does not require you to do all the questions perfectly well to get a high score. In fact, uh, we have seen a lot of students all the time, even getting 10 to 12 questions wrong on let's say quantitative part. So out of 31 questions, if you get around 18 to 19, the right questions, uh, you can still end up with a 49 to 50 in quant. Uh, but it's always about which questions you are skipping and which questions you're, you're actually getting correct. GRE, on the other hand, is very straight focused. It tells you, look, I'm going to give you a section, the first one. It's going to be a medium level, so I'm going to sprinkle easy, medium, and hard questions. I'm going to evaluate your overall performance of this section, and ideally, we want to be above medium level. And if you do that, I'm going to give you a next section, which is going to be higher in overall difficulty level. If you do that, you get better score. If you don't do that, or if you get a section which is easier because you messed up uh, the, the first section, there is there tends to be a <clears throat> what we call a penalty in the GRE, right? So this is the adaptiveness of, of the GMAT. So to put this into perspective, in GMAT, you can miss many questions and still get a very high score, right? You need to find the proper balance between your speed and the accuracy. Uh, whatever GRE section one pretty much decides where you're going to end up, right? Uh, if you have any specific questions on, on the section idea of GRE, let me know. Uh, I, can, I can give you a few more hints. So if you decide with GRE, 
my suggestion is make sure section one you nail. And by nailing, I mean, make sure you get to at least 13 to 14 questions right on the, on the first section. That should be a target. That automatically will help you getting a good, better score, even whatever happens on the second section. Finally, about the, the cost, uh, just to put as a difference, there is not much difference between the two. I mean, <clears throat> G9 is $275 in the US, uh, that it depends on, on different places. In Europe, it's around $250. Uh, GRE is $205, uh, then it depends on, on different countries, uh, the test centers and everything, it varies the pricing. Uh, so in terms of cost, there is not, not much of a difference. Uh, in my opinion, uh, cost should not be a factor when you consider, I put it there just for comparison, but that should not decide which test you take. There are other parameters that will help you make that decision. So now that we have understood at least uh, the, the structure of the test, what they test you on. Uh, the fundamental question why we are here is, well, which should I take, uh, GMAT or the GRE? Uh, but in my opinion, and based on my experience, the right question to ask is, which test is right for me? So it all starts with the self-analysis, seeing what type of person or the test taker you are, what are your strengths and what is your weakness, and see which test actually fits that. Uh, now, I have highlighted some of the parameters that I'm going to walk you guys through, probably with the hope that it helps you to decide which of the tests might fit better than needs. Uh, the first thing we want to discuss is the content of the test. Uh, a lot has been said about the, the verbal uh, part of the GMAT and GRE and the quant. Uh, let's take a deeper look into it. Right. So if you're preparing and you are thinking about the verbal section, uh, <clears throat> this mainly applies to non-native speakers, but also native speakers. Uh, we have a lot of native speakers who still uh, find difficulty between the two. But a general difference is GMA tends to be more uh, grammar intensive and GRE tends to be more vocabulary intensive. Now, if you look at the differences, let's start with reading comprehension. You will find reading comprehension on both. They test the same idea, they test the same comprehension. It's just that the, the, the passages on GRE, they, they tend to be a bit longer uh, than the ones on GMAT, right? So reading comprehension, not too much of a, of a difference. Uh, uh, you will find a lot of vocabulary in GRE, uh, specific question sets that test you on the vocabulary, which means you will have to learn uh, you know, some of the famous words that probably you will never use again. Uh, there are different lists. Uh, at least you will have to learn 700 words for GRE. Uh, GMAT does not require that intense vocabulary. Uh, what it will test you specifically on is on your grammar. So it's more grammar intense, uh, like the, they have a whole section dedicated to sentence correction, which, which will test you on grammar rules, right? So if you think you're a person who, who knows vocabulary or who is okay with learning new words, you find it fun, probably GMAT. But if you are more like rule-based, uh, rule-oriented, and uh, you, you know that you can learn grammar rules and apply them well, maybe GMAT is, is, is better suited for you. Uh, one more thing in GMAT is critical reasoning. Now, now th this is a very, very important concept because uh, it goes beyond just the test. Uh, critical reasoning is where you find flaws in, in the reasoning and try to uh, negate them or support them or weaken uh, in the arguments. So GMAT has a dedicated section that tests you on that. Uh, the whole idea is to build up this capacity in you as a test taker. Uh, GRE will also test you on critical reasoning, but it's hidden inside the reading comprehension questions. So you will learn a bit of critical reasoning, uh, but not so much in, in GRE, right? So overall analysis of verbal, GRE is more vocab intensive, GMAT is more grammar intensive. If you go with GMAT, you surely will learn critical reasoning skills. Uh, if you go with GRE, you will not be learning so much of critical reasoning skills, right? Let's go to point. <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion about the quantitative part in GMAT and GRE, and I I really want to address this properly. Uh, a lot of people on the net, on the internet, and everywhere do say that GRE quant is easier compared to GMAT. <clears throat> now, so if quant by default is easier on GRE, 
it's not gonna make too much of a difference for you because in in terms of percentile, you will still be competing with a lot of amazing people and it's, it's gonna be easy for all of them. So all the standardized tests are, are they always rank you on a curve. Uh, they can be different curves. The, the most common is a, is a normal distribution one. So they're looking at the top 10%, top 20% of the people. And it doesn't matter how many questions you get right or wrong. So if you think from that perspective, the GMAT or GRE puts you against the test takers who have taken the test, just because the quant is easy, it really doesn't, doesn't matter at the end. Now, what it matters is how you feel during the prep, right? If, if quant is something that you are scared of in general, or you are not very comfortable with quantitative thinking, probably GRE would be a, an easier choice just because during the prep, you will feel more comfortable, right? It doesn't matter on the end result, but it's important that while you're doing the prep, you feel confident and you feel comfortable, right? Uh, the, the main difference between the, the quantity part is, as you can see in, in the point two, uh, GRE is, is, is very textbook based. Uh, not always. Uh, I mean, th there, are, there are a few nice questions here and there, but overall, it's, it's more textbook based uh, in the sense that if you know the formula, if you have seen this type of a question before, it's, it's more mathematical. It's, it's like what you do in high school tests, right? There is not much logical thinking that you have to develop inside. While as GMAT requires you to think outside the box. If you are only having mathematical uh, approach to questions, you will, stuck, you will be stuck at a certain level in GMAT. You by default have to expand your logical thinking. Uh, that's why it's called quantitative reasoning. And they really put the emphasis on reasoning in, in the GMAT, right? Uh, there is no calculator in GMAT, as we said before, but there is a calculator in GRE. Now, why is this an important point? Uh, I know a lot of people get excited when they when they think that, hey, well, I have a calculator in GRE, so you know, I'm 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 not going to be making any mistake on the calculation. Well, that is true. That's absolutely true. A G GRE will never give you questions where you can just calculate the answers, right? Or they might even try to trick you on on. Uh, on some aspects of the calculation if you if you don't simplify the questions, for example. But what it gets even more interesting is on the GMAT side. Because you don't have a calculator in GMAT, but you will see some crazy calculations in GMAT, there is a connection. The idea is that you don't need calculations in GMAT. That's why there is no calculator, right? So that's where the logical thinking comes into play. So what can I do? To, to minimize my calculations or to get rid of crazy calculations, crazy multiplications, divisions. That, that is where it pushes you to think, you know, in a, in a different way, rather than just putting the numbers in the calculator and getting the answer. So I just want to make this point again. GMAT will really train you on your logical thinking, right? Uh, and GRE is more the textbook approach to the math in general, in general. Talking about specifics, uh, you are you are likely to find a lot more geometry on GRE than in GMAT. Uh, I don't know the reason. Uh, I have no clue why, but GRE tends to test you heavy on geometry uh, than GMAT. In GMAT, probably around five questions on geometry, uh, whereas on on GRE you are you are you are bound to find many more in general. Uh, another thing in, to keep in mind is in in GMAT uh, the number of the concepts that you will be tested on is, is fairly limited, right? Compared to the GRE one. So you have some, some additional concepts in GRE that you will be tested on. So think of it as the horizontally speaking. So in terms of number of topics, you have to cover a lot more topics for GRE versus for GMAT, it's more about vertical thinking. Fewer topics, but go very deep, uh, understand the concepts very well. Uh, Talking about other specifics based on the data <clears throat> that we have, <clears throat> in, in GMAT, we will have a, a section which is called data sufficiency. <clears throat> you have a similar section in, in GRE, uh, well, not similar, but something similar actually, which is called quantitative comparison. The, these are two types of questions that most of the people haven't seen before. So it takes some time to get used to it and develop your own strategies for this. Uh, historically speaking, and based on the data that we have seen with our students, uh, it takes more time to get better at data sufficiency versus quantitative comparison. So that's something that you will you you will have to 
keep in mind. Uh, another thing is, uh, because GMAT is a reasoning test, uh, I just want to mention it again. The questions that you will see are not very straightforward in the sense that there are always some of the traps that the question uh, master has put inside that if you if you're if there's a logical flaw in your in your in your sequence, you might fall into the trap. And this is pretty common in GMAT versus uh, the GRE. So the questions in GRE are, are pretty much straightforward compared to the GMAT. Right. Okay, so uh, so far we discussed about the content. We understood the structure. Now, I wanna give you some parameters which will help you decide which test is better suited for you, right? Uh, so the first four parameters I'm gonna discuss are based on, on the person, right? It comes from you usually. So you have to think it's, it can change from person to person. The other four are, are specific to the test as such. So they are there and you have to see which one matches with you. The first is, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but a lot of people tend to forget it or, or have this parameter later down in the decision tree. The first thing you have to see is what are your target schools, right? I mean, if you have a list of the schools and you check uh, what exams they need, if they have a specific requirement for one of these tests, you have to take those if they're on your list. Right. There are some schools that only want GRE, or there are some schools that only prefer GMAT or only want GMAT, then you are left with no choice. If that is that school is on your target list, you have to take that test. Right. Uh, apart from having a strict requirement, there's also something in terms of the preference. Right. Uh, if you dig through uh, some of the top schools, for example, uh, Harvard, Stanford, if you go on their website and you look at which test score they prefer, they're pretty open about that they don't prefer any. For them, GMAT and GRE are pretty much the same. Uh, if you go on London Business School's website, uh, and if you try to read between the lines, uh, on London Business School, most of the paragraph is about GMAT. And at the end, they tell you, ah, you can also apply with GRE. Uh, does that make there is, a, there is a preference towards GMAT? Probably yes. And uh, one of the reasons for that is, which we will cover in the next uh, topic is GMAT is heavily connected to the ranking of the schools. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Financial Times or the QS or other economist type of rankings. A part of those rankings is also the average GMAT of the incoming class. So this is, a, this is the score that the schools uh, regularly disclose and share with the, with the ranking uh, teams. So if they take uh, someone with a higher GMAT, it also helps the school in terms of increasing the average of the class. GRE, on the other hand, is not reported. Schools don't have to report the GRE scores. That is sometimes very interesting. And that should help you on the second parameter, which is what is your personal profile and what is your target, right? So based on your profile, if you know that, hey, I have an average application, so I don't know if you're if you're targeting, let's say, London Business School, and you look at the profiles of the students from last year, and you say, okay, I have a fairly average application. I mean, I have done good things, but there is nothing that stands out in general. So I had a decent run. Uh, having a high GMAT score will, will will put the limelight on you, right? Uh, because schools really look at high GMAT scores. It's it's one part of the whole admission decision, not the only one. But if you have a high GMAT, you get attention. That's for sure, right? On the other hand, if you already know that, hey, I have a very great application, right? Uh, I have everything in order. I'm just missing the test. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the test or it really doesn't bother me what I do. Uh, probably you will go with, you will go with GRE. Uh, one of the things that you should always ask yourself is, why are you studying for the test? If your end goal is, I'm going to take the test to get into the school and stop, go with GRE. But if your target is, look, given that I'm going to spend my three to four months of life preparing for a test, I might as well learn some of the skills that will be helpful for me, at least in the business schools, uh, if you're going to study in business schools. Preferably, GMAT should be your option because you learn a lot many things that you will apply straight away in the in the in the in the business school classes and also beyond in the in the workplace, like critical reasoning as we were discussing or uh, logical thinking for for quantitative things, 
And we have seen a lot of this happening uh, with our students in general. So when they prepare for GMAT, the way they, they think about the situations, analyze the data, create the framework, uh, they find it very useful in case studies or case discussions, teamwork, and so on. So th that is a good decision uh, point, actually, because nonetheless, you will spend at least three to four months uh, minimum preparing for one or the other test. Scholarships, a uh, simple one. Uh, so most of the schools, at least, uh, which is very, very clear also on this link here, probably you will, you will get the presentation later so you can actually see it, uh, is a lot of schools, at least uh, to my count, around 19 to 20 schools in Europe have very clear GMAT merit-based scholarship, which means if you have a high score in GMAT, and this high score varies from school to school, uh, you are eligible for a, for a, for a merit-based scholarship. So if scholarship is one of the key things that you need and you definitely are going to a business school, probably, you know, go with the high GMAT. Right. And the, the next one is ah, employee preference. So what do we mean by employee preferences? Once you are done with your studies, <clears throat> and it's, it's mainly applicable to the people who are, who are going to business schools, actually. So if you already know that you, you will be entering the finance or the consulting organizations, maybe, maybe GMAT might make more sense for you. Just because uh, these companies, I'm talking about the, the top consulting firms, so the, the, the MBB, McKinsey, Bain, and Boston, and, and a lot of investment uh, banks or other uh, specific or niche consulting firms that usually appreciate if you have a high GMAT score, high GMAT meaning above 700. Uh, we see it a lot. Uh, it's not official. Uh, for example, McKinsey does not require you to have a GMAT in order for them to interview you. Absolutely not. But they would prefer that if you have a 700 plus, you put it on your CV and it really affects the decision. Uh, in the past, a lot of our students, uh, they didn't have to take uh, the, 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 the McKinsey or the, the Boston test because they had a high score on, on GMAT. So those kind of uh, companies are looking for GMAT. Uh, we also had instances where uh, people who got into MBAs with GRE uh, wanted to get into consulting or finance in the second half year MBA, and they probably had to take GMAT uh, because it was it was kind of required by the by the firms. Uh, this is something that keeps changing, so uh, I'm not going to say that it's it's forever. Uh, keep an eye out for this. Uh, do your research, but it's something to to, to consider. So these are the four parameters uh, from your side in terms of what you want to do, what kind of a person you are, are you looking for scholarships, your, your long-term goals. The other ones are, uh, which are specifically tied to the test itself. <clears throat> so as we said before, vocabulary for GRE, grammar for GMAT. Uh, if you already have a strength in one of the two, that, that should make uh, your choice easier, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't have a clear strength, but uh, as you see, uh, do you see yourself learning uh, 800, 900 different words, or do you see yourself learning more grammar rules, right? So that, that should help you decide, go for GMAT or go for GR. The second are the quantitative skills. Uh, we already discussed this before, but as an, again, ju just to say it out loud again, if you think logically and if you, uh, I mean, if you, if you were not good in math in high school, a lot of people say that I wasn't good in math at high school. I mean, leave that part. Uh, being good in math in school has nothing to do with how you will be in, in GMAT or GRE. But what you have to think about is how you think about problems. Like if you want to follow a certain framework and you cannot think of different uh, solutions, probably GRE will be easier test for you. But if you are kind of a person who likes to problem solve or think uh, around the different solutions or create your own solutions, play with the problems uh, or think, you know, uh, random solutions, not by a certain parameter, maybe GMAT might be a test for you. Uh, one thing is obvious. If you hate geometry, don't go for GRE, right? Uh, so this is about the quantitative skills. Uh, we discussed about the adaptiveness. Uh, so GRE is section adaptive, GMAT is, is question adaptive. <clears throat> as, an, as an advice to people who have uh, text anxiety, uh, high test anxiety, based on our experience, I would say GRE, uh, because you have a calculator, you feel at ease. You can move between the questions in the section. So leave the question blank, 
go to the next one, come back to the question again. Just this flexibility eases out a lot of pressure uh, because by default in GMAT, too long I say, so you will have to prepare for that. Uh, the, the second thing is in terms of the, the integrated reasoning and the AWA on GMAT. Uh, now, these two form a part of the GMAT. Uh, they are there. They are sold separately. Uh, it's not clear how the schools use it. Uh, different schools have different uh, ideas. For example, uh, INSEAD, if you're applying for INSEAD MBA specifically, uh, they would look at your integrated reasoning, right? And what they are looking at is that it's not too low. Uh, what I mean is if you have five or six, it's decent. But if it's, it's three or four, you might have to justify that. Right. So it depends on school to school. So do your research, ask the school. A lot of schools don't even care about these two sections. They don't care about the essay. They don't care about the IR. So it, it depends on the school. Right. Uh, also to understand that in GRE, you have to have a focus for a very long time. Remember, you have to deal with five sections and not just four even though there are only four sections that count. So you need to have a, a mental focus for five sections uh, and jump between math and verbal as it comes. Uh, you cannot plan that beforehand. So some of these things to keep in mind, right? Uh, final thoughts. Now, uh, final thoughts, these are my thoughts uh, based on my experience and uh, me teach GMAT and GRE to different types of students, me doing these. Uh, Apart from understanding what kind of a test taker you are, if you have specific strengths or specific weaknesses in certain areas that tend to shoot towards a certain test, please go for that. If you are neutral, uh, my thought would be, look, if you want to impress a business school uh, admission committee, GMAT is the, is the, is the, is the idea. Usually they, 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 look at, they look at the GMAT, right? Uh, GRE is slightly easier, as we said, in terms of the quant, uh, but only slightly. Remember, it's a percentile thing. It's a game of the curve. So even though it's easier and you feel easy, at the end you will be, you will be has scored with respect to other candidates. So in terms of the final score, it really doesn't play a game. So don't decide on GMAT in terms of just the idea that the quantitative part is, is easy in the final test, right? Uh, we, we had a lot of students who start with one test, then they move to the other. So look at the prep of the students who won this first and then move to the other. In terms of the scoring, there is not too much of a difference, right? So the, the idea is, my suggestion would be, if you are stuck, take a, a sample test of GRE, take a sample test of GMAT. Of course, you will see the scores. Uh, and by the sample test, I would always suggest to do the, the official tests. Uh, they are free. You have two tests on, on, on GRE, which are free of, uh, free of cost, and you have two which are available on GMAT for free of cost. Uh, see how you feel about the, about the test uh, during the test and, and the whole idea of that it's question adaptive, it's section adaptive, how much time, what type of questions, and then take a call, right? Uh, unless you have specific strengths or weaknesses. So that would be my, my final suggestion, guys. And now I think open for Q&A. Thank you very much, Anshu, for this uh, nice presentation and for this uh, overview uh, of the two tests. Uh, yes, indeed, we have, uh, we have a few questions. And for everyone uh, who is still here listening, it's not too late to ask your questions, so go ahead. Uh, OK, let me see. Uh, OK. Um, there is this question. I think you spoke about this a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, but let, let's touch, it, uh, touch upon this again. Which test is better or easier for non-native English speakers? Oh, okay, good one. Uh, again, it, it depends on, on a lot of many things. Look, uh, if you have been reading as a child, uh, reading for a long time, uh, if you are... Uh, if you are genuinely interested in reading and you have been reading for a long time, uh, fiction, nonfiction, whatever, which means your vocabulary has improved a lot. So probably GRE would be easier for you, comes naturally. But if you haven't done that and you are more mathematical in mind, so you are rule-based, probably the grammar one, right? Uh, we had a mix of, of both. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, 
most of our students are non-native English speakers, right? So the only difference we see is in terms of what they want to do. Do they want to learn vocabulary? Does it come naturally for them? Or is it more like grammar rules are easier for them to learn because they can apply, they can see, and it's purely rule-based, right? So uh, if you're a non-native English speaker, both options are correct. It, it depends on do you have any predisposition towards one or the other. Great, thank you. I hope that answers it. <laughs> uh, okay, another interesting question. Um, how early should they start preparing for the GMAT? Is four months <laughs> enough? I guess this really uh, as depends early on as the you person. Can. But yeah, if you can give us some uh, advice. As please. early as you can. Look, uh, it, it, it depends on a lot of many factors. Like how much time is, do you need? I cannot answer that to be, to be very open and transparent. Uh, I would need a lot more input for that. Uh, based on the data we have, like from our students in MOPC in general, uh, a, a good GMAT score usually takes roughly around two to three months, right? But my suggestion is keep four to five months because strange things happen when you are in the curve of preparation for GMAT in general. Uh, as a benchmark, my suggestion is how do you know? Take a diagnostic, whatever score you have, if you are, uh, depending on how much score you have, for every one point, if you are not taking any, 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 any prep course or any help outside help and you're studying on your own, for every one point increase, you need to give at least one to two hours. That should give you an idea if you're not taking any prep course, right? So as an example, your diagnostic score is 500. Your target score is 700. You are 200 points behind, right? You're not taking any prep. Double that by two, just double it. 400 hours is what you will need. But if you are taking a prep or other help, uh, tutoring or whatever, it might be different, but it gives you a window. And, and then you can divide that 400 hour by how much time you have every day to see how many months. General piece of advice is whenever you see you have a free time or a window of three, four months where you don't have too much workload or you can manage your time two hours a day, more or less, start prepping for the GMAT, always advised. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, okay, from what I hear, GMAT is more prestigious test. Is that correct? Uh, okay, I'm sorry to say it again, but it depends. <laughs> uh, it, it depends. It depends on one thing. Uh, first of all, if you're talking about B schools, uh, specifically business schools, maybe. Uh, it's more prestigious, yes, because this is a test that is, the, the, these are the scores that are reported for the ranking. Uh, these are the scores that are reported on the website, right? So if you have a GMAT, a high GMAT score, as I was saying in my presentation, you get the attention, right? But of course, the other part of the application has to support it. It cannot just be 750 and nothing. Uh, but yes, uh, from that perspective, yes, I would say so. But only from that perspective, not in absolute terms. Okay, great. Um, and one last question just came in uh, in the Q&A box. Um, I, I'm not sure you can answer this, but uh, let me um, read it out li loud. Uh, what's the mode of payment for the GMAT and how can it be accessed? Uh, okay, so uh, I imagine that they're speaking about the, the, the GMAT exam. Uh, so the, the, the best way to, to answer that is uh, check it on mba.com but you have all the information there. Uh, in terms of the, the mode of payment, they accept everything uh, from credit cards to, to phone payments to money order. So they are very versatile in terms of accepting different types of payments for the GMAT. Uh, in terms of how the test can be accessed, uh, there are two types of uh, GMAT tests that you can take. One is going to the test center and taking it as a specific place at a specific time, uh, which you have to book in advance. So you go to the test center and take the test there, or which is the, the classic GMAT, or the other one which was started uh, in response to COVID last year is, is new online GMAT, which you can take from anywhere uh, in the world. And, uh, it's practically available 24 seven, 365. So all you have to do is uh, have a, a proper laptop that, that adheres to the specification and you're ready to go. Usually you can book it even one day before the test. So. Yeah, pretty flexible. Great, thank you for this useful uh, tip. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so I want to just say again, thank you. It was uh, really 
um, exhaustive uh, presentation of the two tests, and we hear a lot of valuable information, and I hope we were useful uh, to pleasure. our attendees. <laughs> My, my uh, pleasure, Nelly, and, and thank you everyone who attended. I hope uh, you, you got some, some uh, decent info from this. Uh, in, in case you have any other questions, uh, please, you can reach out to us anytime. Uh, th this phone is my personal phone, so I use WhatsApp a lot. Please feel free to drop me a text on WhatsApp. Uh, don't hesitate. I will, I will try to address any questions you have. Uh, and thanks, Nelly, for, for having us. It was indeed a pleasure. Thanks a lot, and good luck, guys or whatever you choose. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.